Yeah, this is really interesting. I wanted to ask you about um, an incident that was in the news recently uh, that some people have started referring to as Climate Gate. Mm -hmm. uh, what was this all about? Well, you know, this is basically confirmation of what a lot of the so-called skeptics, as Al Gore likes to refer to them as, had, had known or at least suspected for a long time that the data was being skewed. And, uh, for example, the, the, uh, the assertion that the climate has warmed in the last 10 years and been warmer than any time in, you know, within thousands of years has many problems with it. And again, it, it requires a very selective use of data. Um, for example, the data that we use to determine temperature change comes primarily from three sources. Ground-based temperature data collection stations, which are usually, you know, at, at meteorological stations or at airports, uh, weather balloons and satellites, microwave sounding units carried aboard satellites. Um, the ground-based shows an increase in temperature the, in the last oh, 20 to 30 years. The ground-based definitely shows an increase in temperature. The satellite-based data, which presumably on all accounts is, is, would be considered the most accurate, does not show a temperature increase in the last several decades. Um, in fact, it shows a slight cooling within the last 10 years, and that, doesn't, that does not account for this year's, this winter. We've already seen that this has been an extremely cold winter. And once the temperatures of this last winter have been factored into the averages, we may see that there's been a fairly significant decline in temperature within the last 10 years. Just as the IPCC exclusively relies on ice core data for pre-industrial concentrations of CO2, they rely on ground-based data for the reconstruction of temperatures over the last 100 to 150 years. Um, the problem with ground-based data is that it's subject to all kinds of contamination, primarily from the urban urbanization effects. So, what, so what was happening in the climate gate scenario? This was, <clears throat> I believe, like a, a hacking of emails that were internal to a climate research unit in in. Yeah, and in I UK. haven't had a chance to go through. There's a lot of emails there. I have spent a number of hours sifting through some of that. And, and it's pretty clear that there is a, an effort to, um, for example, there are references to, to hiding the decline, which refers directly to coming up with a way of statistically hiding the fact that the temperature has declined slightly in the last 10 years when, you know, back in the late 80s and through the 90s, it was predicted that it was going to go through this extraordinary increase. And then, you know, it, the climate didn't cooperate. It didn't go through this increase in temperature that was predicted. Mm -hmm. And so all of the models as to what's going to be happening 50 or 100 years from now are all based upon this trend that was going to be getting underway in the 90s and into the 21st century. And the trend didn't materialize. So essentially what it did was it rendered all of the models that had been based upon a projection of this trend pretty much meaningless. So in the emails, they are actually discussing ways to statistically hide the fact that the temperature declined in the last 10 years. Who were, who were writing the emails? Who were these people? Oh, I, you know, it was Phil Jones. Who I mean, was, what, what roles do they play? Well, he was, I think he was the head researcher at East Anglia University, um, where, who was providing a lot of the climate data to the IPCC, the raw data. Okay. And a lot of independent researchers had been claiming for years that they had been seeking to get the original raw data that these temperature projections were being based upon, and, and the, uh, they wouldn't release the data. And um, so there was uh, Freedom of Information Acts filed to try to get access to the data upon which these temperature projections were being made. And in the emails, there's discussion of how they can stall or avoid altogether releasing this data uh, to the independent researchers. Uh, there was a, a relatively now famous quote attributed to Phil Jones where he's saying, uh, this was not in Climate Gate, but this was a, with an interviewer. He said, you know, why should I release my data to somebody who just wants to prove it wrong? Except somebody needs to sit Phil Jones down and explain to him that that's how science works. And if you want to talk about peer-reviewed 
the peer review process, that's exactly what it is. You come up with a scientific theory, a scientific model, you go before your peers, and they attempt to rip it apart. And if at the end of the day, there's still something intact, it proves that you have a sound basis for your theory. What we see happening here is that the very people who are shouting the loudest about the peer-reviewed literature are scared to death of the peer-reviewed process. They will not allow their data. And then when it finally came that they, that they were being forced to release the data, they said that um, the data had basically been lost. And wasn't there also an aspect of the climate gate controversy about exclusion of, of kind of fringe beliefs on what they consider to be more fringe beliefs being excluded from their peer-reviewed uh, journals and... Yeah, see the peer review process is, is a valid and powerful process, but it's also subject to being abused. And I mean, when you have a lot of money involved in this, rightfully, uh, the research done by scientists who have received money from, say, the fossil fuel industry, should be suspect. You want, might want to take a closer look at the data. Ultimately, of course, that does not determine the validity of the science. Uh, you know, that's, that's the, the classic ad hominem argument. Um, okay, you, you, you know, you are associated with so-and-so. What we find, for example, is um, James Hogan, who is, who is a public relations uh, individual from Vancouver who has done a lot of uh, advocacy for, for Al Gore and for the um, for the consensus of, of climate change has uh, essentially uh, said that the, that, the, um, that the global warming people are all, he, he makes the implication that they're all on the payroll of the fossil fuel industry. Right. Uh, he, he refers to it as, as a lot of the media people do. The anti-global warming people, right? Yeah, the anti, yeah. anti uh, well, I would say the pro-anthropogenic global warming people. Okay. Okay, have, have made the claim that there is a conspiracy mm -hmm. uh, funded by the fossil fuel industry. They refer to it as the denial machine. Mm -hmm. They cite some examples that, you know, Fred Singers, uh, who's been one of the leading critics, his wife was formerly associated with somebody who was associated right. with the tobacco company. And they make these long chains of connections that is supposed to imply the guilt or the untrustworthiness of their research. But again, what they're not actually doing like you can, an article in, in the, the Yes magazine that's kind of a left-leaning liberal environmentally oriented magazine has got their current issue devoted to the subject of global warming. It has an article by, by James Hogan in there and, and basically, you know, he doesn't address any of the actual science. It's all casting aspersions because somebody may have received money at one time from mm -hmm. the fossil fuel industry and they cite the fact that the fossil fuel industry has, they've documented that they have um, subsidized climate research to the tune of $200 million. So, and I say fair enough, you know, that, that's reason enough to, to question the data and, and take a closer look at it. But at the same time, they don't acknowledge that $4 billion a year coming from governmental sources is not in its own way biasing outcomes. If 200 million total, the total funding of climate change research, and this is from, from their figures themselves um, over the last, whatever, 20 years or so, if that is to be suspect, then shouldn't the 30 billion or so that's gone come from government sources, shouldn't that also be suspect? Mm -hmm. Why do we say automatically that if it's industry funded, we're not even gonna look at it, but if it's government funded, we're going to trust it implicitly without any question. So what's, what's the concern then with the government funding, funding this, science, this other data? I mean, what, what could be the, you know, the underlying motive for the, for the government to want to make it appear like humans? Well, what you see now is you see a collusion of interests here. You see the government. I mean, let, let's stop for a minute and think about what we just saw over in Copenhagen. Here you had 16,000 delegates flying on, you know, first class on jets many of them private jets on others, having this grand meeting in Copenhagen, uh, renting every luxury hotel suite in, in the city, uh, completely de depleting the entire nation of limousines and caviar. Do you think that if there was no global warming agenda, these people would have any, uh, any, any business being over there? Uh, you know, you take away global warming and you've taken away this whole uh, this whole constituency of, 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 of 
government-funded bureaucracies and bureaucrats and, and uh, agents and so forth that are involved in this process.